Native Society Part 4, Session 3R. This session, we will be discussing the important subjects of education and labor that determine the prospects of any country. We begin with education for the next few sessions. Investment in education represents the most important expenditure that a country can make if it is to be successful. The standard of living that any country enjoys is directly related to the general level of educational attainment of its citizens of the, that its citizens have achieved. The more tertiary educated, specialist trained persons in as diversified an array of, of areas as possible, this will redound to the benefit and the wealth of a, of a community with one caveat. The factors of production must be in balance. The education system should be as widely arrayed as possible, offering as many types of training as is possible. Of even greater import, import of, even great, of even greater importance are the efficacy of the vehicles to be used to provide this education. Are state-run facilities the best way to deliver this? Should the state provide education free of charge, or should there be a copay arrangement such that students and their parents accept some responsibility in ensuring that success is had and there not be this wasteful phenomenon of student failure that we witness globally annually? It is certainly time for a fresh thinking and perspective on, the, on this. In many new site value, in any new site value taxation dispensations, the, gov the government must see itself principally as a facilitator, always leveling the playing field and directing the necessary resources to the various areas of need in an efficient and effective manner. When we look at the statistics globally on education, we see that more than 50% of the resources provided up and that up as, end up as a wasteful expenditure. Less than 50% of persons being su successful, certainly at secondary school certification. And this must be concerning that this wasteful expenditure continues year in, year out. The solution then must at least be in a public-private partnership where the state partners with bodies of professional education providers to administer the educational system, at least at the primary and secondary levels. There are many examples of success of this approach over the centuries. The denominational schools have, over the centuries, provided successful examples of this, and the charter school system is a more recent example. These entities have shown that they have had greater success at control, discipline, academic achievement and the character building over their charges than in the public school system where the results are much less impressive and consistent. They also seem to have better control and success with their teachers. Another area where there need be some reform is on the stress or emphasis on academic achievement. In most countries, those persons who have not done well at their 16 plus or 18 plus examinations, those who have not attained secondary school or tertiary level certification have overtly, if not covertly, been deemed as failures, even if there are some of us who would have failed at these levels. An SPT regime cannot afford them to be written off because it is an all hands on deck regime. All hands are needed to man the system so that a system of apprenticeship and mentorship must be included in the employment policies of the enterprises to include those persons who would need more time to acquire the relevant qualifications and skills, while at the same time being gainfully employed. Of course, there will still be the existence of matriculation examinations at the various levels, as is now the case in the primary, secondary, and tertiary organizations, but an extra emphasis will now be placed on capturing those persons 
would have slipped through the cracks previously and encouraged and channeled them into areas of employment and training activities such that over time they will become full-fledged, resourceful, and valuable contributors to the economy of the community. The next category of citizens that should have their educational status upgraded in an SVT economy are those persons who are functionally, functionally or, and or completely illiterate. In many developing countries, the level of functional and complete illiteracy is substantial, and these persons cannot supply the communities with anything more than basic unskilled services. The requirements for countries to attain developed country status in the 21st century is firstly, most of its citizens must possess the skills and know-how to provide the goods and services that such advanced economies will want to produce. A minimum level of technical education is therefore required of persons for this to be possible. Even today in the developed world, there is a shortage of these skilled personnel. Adult education centers would have to be just as prominent as secondary or primary schools, where those adults who would have fallen through the cracks as far as their formal education was concerned would have the opportunity to attain secondary educational certification. Thereafter, they could move on to tertiary level and acquire the needed skills. The necessary promotions, encouragement, and incentives would have to be devised and, devised and provided for these persons to come on board. This may be the most challenging aspect of such a program to convince older adults of the necessity of going back to school and acquire new skills. The state's role in this new educational education initiative will now be facilitator rather than provider. They will provide the educational facilities, the regulatory framework, the curriculum blueprints, the educational standards to attain, and finally the accreditation systems. The educational facilities would be initially, initially provided, but the responsibility to maintain and upgrade same would fall to an education, educational management organization, EMO, that would be delivering the educational services. The regulatory framework would be provided by an education service commission that would vet all the teaching appointments, adjudicate on disciplinary appeals of teaching staff, investigate and report on any matters that may be reported by students and parents and liaison with the government for the implementation of the curb curriculum blueprints and enforcement of educational ed accreditation standards. So far, what do we think of these proposals? Let's have our usual break now. The EMOs would be offered five-year contracts with the option to extend for another five years. The initial letting and extending would be carried out by the ESEs and would be based on strict guidelines of management and teaching capacities and experience. EMOs could be either be local or foreign-based, and this would also be the case for teaching and other professionals if the minimum standards in both cases are being met. EMOs would be required to provide all the services that would ensure the successful running of the educational facilities. An EMO could be contacted, contracted for multiple facilities, of course, depending on its capacity. This would include the capacity to provide the necessary maintenance and refurbishment services to the physical plant, furniture, and other sundries. The EMOs would be of various types for primary schools, secondary schools, secondary schools for the arts and music, 
secondary schools for sports management and performance and, ad and adult educational schools. The public-private partnership for the management and operation of education is, li is likely to yield much better results as far as discipline, educational excellence, and better character of our young charges. The evidence provided by denominational schools and charter schools worldwide suggests that this is a better option. The state should leave the business of education in specialist private hands and provide the necessary vision and supervision as far as regulations and standards are concerned. Curriculum development. There has been much emphasis on curriculum as far as education is concerned, and the intention here is not to thread a beaten track as far as this subject is concerned, except to stress that in an SVT environment, there will be need to provide a wider array of educational training for the wider array of services that would be possible in this regime. The other possible consideration is that the curriculum should take the longer view, that the educational model should allow for apprenticeship in the workplace for those persons who would need a longer period of maturation and acquisition of skills and know-how. A much longer view would also be needed for those acquiring and pursuing adult education. There have, however, been a few grand omissions where curriculum development is concerned, and this is worldwide. Maybe these omissions were because the educational education fraternity probably sees these matters as the responsibility of others in the community. But because the education system holds the youth as a captive audience more than any other, it seems to be the best place to address them. These matters relate to life experiences, to the life experiences of all of us. And some of us may have been, may have had to wrestle with these issues at some point in our lives. These are drug addiction, alcoholism, anger management issues, sexual deviance, kleptomania, and other proclivities towards criminal activity. The general descent of morals and values are also to be included. Because so many of these issues may affect us, or our loved ones, friends and acquaintances, it is now incumbent on us to treat with these, if only at a superficial level. Preparing adolescents for the real world also means preparing them to confront these ignominies in addition to providing the traditional educational training. You may contend that these may be ideally handled by good parenting or good pastoral intervention, but the school environment is a very captive one with minds that are their most impressionable. To miss the opportunity would indeed be a grand omission. Another area that certainly needs intervention in the curriculum is that of physical health. There is no doubt that there is a prevalence of poor eating and lifestyle habits which has led to obesity, non-communicable chronic diseases, hypertension, diabetes, and heart disease, and, and huge financial health budgets. The curriculum must include in their schedules advice and tutelage on how to best lead a healthy lifestyle to avoid these health issues in later lives. Just consider the impact this can have on these lives if they are indoctrinated from, an, from a young age. We have received no formal education on this in the past, and we are much poorer for it. And it is not enough to inform the students of what constitutes healthful living or ethical moral living. They must be subjected to formal examinations on these subjects in much the same way as they would on traditional subjects. It is only through measures such as these that such matters would be taken seriously and the knowledge therein would be useful in the adult lives of these students. The list of subjects that could be included in the curriculum could look something like this. Anger management that may result in physical, mental and emotional abuse. Substance abuse management, alcoholism, drug addiction and abuse, prescription drug abuse and addiction, etc. Good parenting, 
sexual deviance, behavior mitigation, pedophilia, hetero and homosexual deviance, etc. Kleptomania management, including criminal tendency mitigation, and ethics, values and morals education. We will end this session here today at this point. Next week, we will continue our discussion on the new subject, labor and education. Before we end, I would like again to let you attendees know that Unsustainable Development is an educational offering devoted to the dissemination of its course to all of mankind and to those who have the English language as their official language in the first instance and to all eventually all over the world. We, in, we have in fact been sending this course all over the English speaking world with very favorable responses. To continue to make this possible and because we do not charge a fee for this dissemination, we rely wholeheartedly on monetary donations to meet the cost of achieving these goals. If you have found these sessions useful thus far and would like others to have access to them, we would gratefully accept your donations should you be inclined to offer them. You can send donations to our PayPal account at the email address nigelgittens at gmail.com. Thank you for your kind gesture.